On Thursday, WA opposition leader Zach Kirkup announced his daring new election strategy, give up. Two weeks out from the WA state election and tonight we already have a concession of defeat. The opposition leader admits he's lost, saying 2021 is not his time. The Liberal leader admitted he was unlikely to win. I recognise that Mark McGowan would be the Premier of Western Australia. Come on, Zach, you're, you're meant to play the underdog, not the six feet underdog. Seriously, you can't be that far behind. New figures show Labor leading the Liberals 68 to 32, two party preferred. Premier Mark McGowan also has unprecedented levels of support with a staggering 83% of those surveyed. You know, as they say in politics, there's only one poll that counts and it's the one two weeks before the election day that says you're screwed. On Friday, after New South Wales sent the Palaszczuk government a bill for quarantining Queenslanders, we saw the Queensland Deputy Premier process that invoice. Queensland's Deputy Premier, meantime, Stephen Miles, says it was very satisfying to rip up a tax invoice from the New South Wales government. The eye-watering $30 million bill is for Queensland residents who quarantine in Sydney. Last year, the states agreed to pay for their own citizens. Yeah, you know, I tried that, but the ATO told me ripping up bills does not make them less real. Most people didn't take the stunt seriously, but it really upset 2GB Sydney's Ben Fordham in a weirdly specific way. I mean, when I saw it, I thought, this is the kind of thing that you might do if you're a boyfriend and a girlfriend and you're 15 years of age and really immature and it's your first love and someone's broken your heart and you think they might have cheated on you, so you rip up a letter that they sent you. And if you're really desperate and really immature, you might film it as well and send it to the person who broke your heart. That's what he's done with us. Who hurt you, Ben? Who hurt you? To Saturday. And Scott Morrison's week that would never end continued not ending. Scott Morrison received an anonymous letter attaching a detailed statement from a woman who alleges she had been raped by a man who is now a cabinet minister. The allegation from 1988 before the man entered politics and the alleged victim has since taken her own life. For the government, the hits keep on coming, with revelations today that two other cabinet ministers are now facing legal action over alleged workplace bullying of a former staff member. And if that wasn't enough, the Coalition also lost Nicole Flint, the MP currently holding South Australia's most marginal seat. A federal Liberal MP who has spoken openly about the treatment of women in Parliament announced today she's quitting politics. Her time in politics has been plagued by harassment. She's spoken openly about being stalked by someone she described as a creepy old man and copping criticism from an ABC columnist over the way she dresses. Her electorate office has been egged and vandalised several times with obscene slogans. But Miss Flint is yet to reveal exactly what tipped her over the edge. Is it perhaps that? Like all of that? Well, I guess we'll never know. I mean, sure, the camel's back is broken, but it's yet to reveal exactly which straw was responsible. Luckily, the International Women's Day Breakfast provided an opportunity for Scott Morrison to smooth things over by sending out the government's best spokesperson for women, Scott Morrison. So. I just wanted to share with you my own personal thoughts about the very issue that brings us here together today, and that is women. Women. Can't live with them, can't live without them. Am I right, guys? Oh, no guys here. <laughs> Weird breakfast. But as is tradition, when everything is on fire, the Prime Minister headed for the beach, where the press could catch him completely showing up former PM Harold Holt by actually returning to land. With the New South Wales Police closing their investigation due to insufficient evidence, it's worth stressing that these are just allegations and they've been strenuously denied. But the PM was still facing the PR problem of how to handle allegations like this. Someone with very firm views was former PM Malcolm Turnbull, whose reform of the toxic Canberra culture amounted to banning Barnaby Joyce from sleeping with any more staff. I think the ball is really in the court of the minister concerned. I mean, he knows who he is, but you know, I think for the sake of his colleagues, the government, everybody, he should front up and, and state who it is. I tell you what, if that guy ever becomes Prime Minister, the culture really might change. Until then, I'm just going to have to dust off my old game of parliamentary alleged historical sex crime, guess who? OK. Is the minister in question a male? Yes. Shit. Well, I'm all out of ideas. 
What? He's going to tell us himself? Shit! Attorney General Christian Porter is about to hold a news conference. Let's take you live to Perth. I am not standing down or aside. The things that I have read did not happen. They just never and that was Christian Porter identifying himself as the captive minister against whom an historical rape allegation has been made. Well, my way was heaps more fun. On Sunday, more news of the ongoing Gaga saga. TMZ is reporting that Lady Gaga's dog walker was shot multiple times by gunmen who then stole her beloved pets. Yeah, as a dog lover, I am appalled. And as a dog walker liker, I'm miffed. As was Gaga, who wanted her dogs back badly. The singer is offering a $500,000 reward for the return of her dogs. No questions asked. No questions will be asked if she can get the dogs back safely. No questions asked. Ooh, I think the dog walker might have some questions. Like, uh, why did you shoot me? Just take the dogs. They're not even mine. But all's well that ends well. This morning, a Hollywood ending. Well, I suppose, if you ignore the guy getting shot. Lady Gaga's two beloved pets, her dogs Koji and Gustav, recovered safely and unharmed. I didn't know how this was going to turn out, and I don't think anybody did. So when I got the call that the dogs got returned, it was it was honestly a... I almost want to say it was a bigger shock than, than the night it actually happened because it was so unexpected. So this is a bigger shock than the actual shooting. Once again, I, I reckon the dog walker might have some questions. Monday. And for most of the morning, Australia waited with bated breath to finally hear the former US president talk again. Just five weeks after leaving the White House, Donald Trump is due to give his first speech at a conservative conference. Think about it. No press conferences, no Twitter. I, for one, have missed his lyricism. And so have the organisers of the Conserva Comic Con, CPAC. CPAC's chief organiser, Matt Schlapp, handed the former president a prime speaking slot, closing out the conference Sunday. I like the fact that he wants to stay engaged. Now, you can say that he lost the election, but his supporters, 73 million... Well, he did lose the election. You can say that he lost the election, and he, I... He did lose the election. Yeah, yeah. CPAC was so excited for Trump's victory tour, it even brought out the very Christian gold effigy of him holding a wand and a copy of the Constitution, which I'm pretty sure thou shouldn't do. But that's just Trump, baby. His first public appearance since leaving office over a month ago. Even his political naysayers aware of his grip on the base. Indeed. Saying nay usually just made him grip the base tighter, allegedly. So, what did Trump actually say? A Republican president will make a triumphant return to the White House. And I wonder who that will be. Uh, we have tremendous... Uh, Mr. McLaughlin just gave me numbers that nobody's ever heard of before. 11 tween, 30, 3 billabs. These are just some of the numbers that will win the White House in 2024. Also on Monday, the Aged Care Royal Commission released a damning report. The final report of the Aged Care Royal Commission has found the extent of substandard care in the system is unacceptable and deeply concerning. The report said many of the system's failings and poor governance were the result of successive governments' desire to rein in spending. The truly horrific findings were contained in eight volumes and 148 recommendations that would take some time to fully process. The government gave the media half an hour. You've given us half an hour's notice to attend a press conference. You tabled the report while we were here. How can we ask questions that are relevant to what's in the report without knowing what's in it? There'll be plenty of opportunities to ask many questions. Yeah, and you could tell by his response how thrilled he was to have the opportunity to answer those questions. The Royal I'm the Prime Minister. This is my minister. Our cabinet will decide our response to this Royal Commission, OK? So, so we've released it. I think I've answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Well, to be fair, he did answer her question. If the question was, who is the Prime Minister? On Tuesday night, Nepal's Constellation Cup tipped off as Australia's diamonds were beaten by New Zealand in the tournament opener. But all the attention was on a revolution within the diamonds, where the team has elected to abandon a single captain in favour of a group leadership approach. Or, as the Australian put it, they've declared the Socialist Republic of Netball. For more on this, we cross to our court report... Sorry, Netball court reporter, Vidya Rajan. Vidya, is Netball really socialist? 
No, Charlie, of course it isn't. It's a communist front. And it's all laid out in the rules of the Netball Manifesto. In Netball, players must stay in their designated territories, or thirds, behind what are essentially iron curtains. Crossing between East Netball and West Netball is strictly prohibited. Players must never hold the ball for more than three seconds, because in the communist sport of netball, keeping a possession is for capitalist scum. And everyone is assigned a position to serve the greater good, from far left wing attack to the re-education centre to the great goalkeeper. Because in this game, it's from each according to their netball ability to each according to their netball team's need, as exemplified in the work of heroic comrade Magda Zhabansky. Video Rajan there. Uh, she's not a communist, of course. The ABC would never hire a communist. To today, Wednesday, and to my favourite story of the week. You might remember some philosophical differences I've had with a couple of animals lately. I hate that duck. I hate that koala. I do hate that duck. I'm still not thrilled about that koala. But now a new animal has caught my eye. This rooster. An Indian man was stabbed to death by his own rooster after he attached a three-inch knife to its leg for an illegal cockfight. And if it was a cockfight he wanted, it was a cockfight he got. The owner was preparing for the fight when the rooster knifed him in the groin, leaving him cock-a-doodle dead. The rooster is in police custody. Seriously. A rooster is in safe, protective custody of the police in Telangana in a death case. Will he face charges? Who knows? But I shall not turn my back on this rooster. This rooster is a hero. He's tough. He's scrappy. He's hard. And if there's one thing you should know about Charlie Pickering, it is this. I love a hard cock. And I cannot imagine that coming back to haunt me.